Welcome. My name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'm your host for today's second Field of Work webinar for the season. This is brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension, and it's the ninth year that we've done the series, and we're really glad you've chosen to join us. We have archived all of the webinars from the previous years, and the link is on our Field to Fork webinar page. The next slide shows the upcoming webinars, and we hope you join us for these as well. The following slide shows the webinar controls, and because we have a lot of people joining us, we invite you to post your questions and comments in the chat. Um, this program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. And I'll ask all of you to complete the short survey that will be emailed right after today's webinar. So I have some special instructions. We are combining the two years of data. So you will see 2023 dates, but if you scroll down, you will see the 2024 dates. So just scroll down the page to 228-2024 and you can enter your information at that point. Again, I welcome you to today's webinar. And the next slide has the name of our speaker and the topic. Dr. Esther McGinnis is our speaker. She is an Extension Horticulturalist and Director of the NDSU Extension Master Gardener Program and also an Associate Professor within the Department of Plant Sciences. She and her grad students research pollinator attraction, plants that take cyclical saturation and drought, and also native plants. So I thank Esther for joining us, and I think we will all learn a lot from her talk, Gardening with Arthritis and Pain. Thank you, Julie. So I'm just thrilled to, to be part of Field to Fork again this year. Always enjoy interacting with your audience. Um, well, before we dive into the meat of this talk, you know, we first have our non-discrimination statement. And I wish I had a little bit more elegant way of saying it, um, but the best I can do is, is say that we at NDSU practice the golden rule. And we, we do not discriminate against anybody. If there are any issues, um, please contact our provost office. All right, so now back to our talk on gardening with arthritis. We all know that gardening is good for our health, and it's, it's for every age group. We know this is true of young people. We know this is true of people in middle age and, and senior citizens. Now, if we look at children, it's so important to teach them how to garden. You know, they learn about science, but on the other hand, they also get the joy of growing vegetables. And they're more likely to try vegetables and have more adventurous diets if in fact they do garden. Um, now these benefits continue as we get older and there've been lots of papers talking about, you know, the physical, mental and spiritual benefits of gardening and also being in nature. But this becomes even more important as we age. Um, so we've got some studies here showing that gardeners score higher in all major health indices. Um, and they have more hand strength. So this is very important. Now I see this in my own mother, you know, she has troubles opening jars and such because she doesn't have the hand strength that she used to. But gardeners that stay active, that dig in the soil, that use pruners are more likely to maintain that hand strength. You know, there are social benefits. We find that lots of, you know, independent living facilities, um, assisted living, skilled nursing, they're all starting to integrate gardening into their landscapes because it's really a social issue. The nursing home nursing home and assisted living residents are more engaged in the life of the community than those that don't garden. And this makes sense. I mean, gardeners are kind of a chatty group. We're a friendly group. We like to share our knowledge with one another and we like to talk and make friends. So this is, this is very important. I mean, you've been probably seeing in the news that we've got an epidemic of loneliness. But if you're gardening, you know, at the, the nursing home, you're more likely to be social and to be making friends. 
And this continues as we get even older. Um, so individuals with cognitive decline, so think dementia and Alzheimer's, we find that they have increased functioning if they garden. And when I say garden, I mean very basic tasks or maybe just even walking in the garden. So I'm reminded of a story that a master gardener told me. So a lot of our master gardeners do work with nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And this one individual um, did a, a really spectacular job of maintaining the ornamental gardens around the nursing home. One day, this individual with Alzheimer's um, got out without anybody noticing. So you can imagine there was a lot of alarm, you know, because somebody could have gotten hurt, you know, um, particularly when you have somebody with cognitive difficulties leaving the facility. So they mounted a big search and they found this individual and she was in the garden and she noticed that they were a little upset. And she said to them, why are you so upset? You should have known I would have been here. This is the only place I want to go. I thought that was really poignant that here we had somebody with Alzheimer's and she knew that she needed to get to the garden for comfort. So I found that was really, really touching that gardens continue to have a, a major impact on our lives from, from birth until our oldest years. But we've got challenges. So I can imagine there are some of you online that have arthritis in your hands. So that can make things very difficult. My own father has arthritis in his back and in his knee. So he's in a wheelchair. I have back issues. I've actually had back issues since I was in my late 20s. But I've managed to keep them pretty much at bay. But these are things that can make it challenging to garden. And in fact, they can pose a barrier to gardening. You know, probably one of the major issues that prevents people from gardening is arthritis. And that's a, a collective term for over 100 conditions that involve joint inflammation. And anytime you have a joint that's inflamed, you're going to have swelling and inflammation of the surrounding tissue. Uh, I was shocked to see that close to 50 million people in the U.S. have arthritis. I mean, that's a huge, huge proportion of individuals. Um, so this makes this talk very relevant. But we may have other individuals that are on this webinar today, and you may not have arthritis, but you may have pain. You may have pain when you bend over. You may have pain when you kneel to garden or if you're pushing or pulling something, lifting or carrying things, or using tools, you may find that it's hard to grasp the tool. So regardless of whether you have arthritis or not, if you have some form of pain, this talk will be for you. <clears throat> We're gonna introduce the term of adaptive gardening. So adaptive gardening is making gardening accessible for everybody, you know, regardless of your abilities and regardless of how mobile you are. Um, with adaptive gardening, we want to not just remove barriers, we want to smash those barriers so you can continue to garden and continue to reap all those health benefits from gardening. Um, one of the most important goals of adaptive gardening is to work smarter, not harder. And we're going to have a lot of tips about that in today's talk and to minimize pain and strain on the body. So here's my outline for the talk. Um, the first third of the talk, we're going to talk about customizing your garden area to work for you um, and taking in, into account your special needs. In the second third, I'm going to introduce some warm-up exercises. There's some that are specific for arthritis, but I also have some more general exercises. So I'm hoping that you're going to move today. I'm hoping that this will be one of the more interactive webinars that you've participated in and that you're moving and trying out these exercises. These exercises are, are quite simple. And then in the final third, we're going to talk about tools. What gardener doesn't like talking about tools? I wish I had more money so I could buy more tools because I just love them. But these are special ergonomic tools that help minimize strain on your body. So does your garden look like this? 
Do you have an in-ground garden? Is it large enough to feed a family of 15? You know, maybe this is the point where you start reevaluating. So if that in-ground garden is no longer working for you, um, you know, start asking yourself as you listen to this presentation, what type of garden would work for you? And as you continue to age, what is the right size of garden for you? You know, you probably don't have to feed 20 people. Maybe you only have a, a couple people at home. So consider what's the right size? <clears throat> is the garden in a convenient location? <clears throat> I like to have my garden fairly close to the house. I've got kind of a kitchen garden that's right on my deck. So I can just step outside and grab a handful of rosemary or basil. And, and then a little bit further away, I've got my raised garden bed where I can go grab tomatoes. So having that garden closer to your home, making it more of a kitchen garden may work better for you. And then you gotta think about proximity to water. You're not going to want to be carrying uh, a bucket of water to your garden. If you can, you know, have a longer hose um, or, or even consider having an automated irrigation system for your garden. So all of this is about working smarter, not harder. Uh, raised beds will be a topic that we cover in, in great detail here. And this helps us to minimize kneeling and bending and reaching. This allows us to be a little bit more accessible. This happens to be a raised bed that we have on campus at NDSU. It was designed 20 years ago to facilitate gardening by those in wheelchairs. So you'll see that we've got... Um, We've got these U-shaped bays. People can wheel their wheelchair in and start gardening. It should be at, at the right height. Or, you know, somebody with a walker can get in there and they can lean on the wall and, you know, just go around the U-shape and pull weeds or, or deadhead flowers and such. <clears throat> um, but I have to admit that um, the volunteers that volunteer in the garden, our master gardeners, like to garden here too. And, and none of them are in wheelchairs or in walkers. It's still just a nice place to garden because you don't have to bend over. So the previous photo was of a garden that was designed 20 years ago for wheelchairs. Um, we're starting to, you know, think a little bit more strategically. We're starting to think more ergonomically. I like the garden that you see in this photo. Um, as you look at it, you'll see that on the right hand side, we've got kind of a, a tabletop garden and it's got a cutout for, for people's uh, feet and their knees. So somebody can go over there in a wheelchair and get really close to the table so they don't have to reach as far. Um, so I absolutely just love this, but it's it's not just for people confined to wheelchairs. You know, you could you could sit there in a regular chair and garden. Um, here's another one for individuals in wheelchairs. This is from the Chicago Botanic Garden. And I love how the two little tabletops here are set at different heights. Uh, so individuals um, that are shorter could go on the left and then you've got uh, on the right allows more space if somebody's taller. Um, so it, having having space like this, having a be adjustable is just absolutely terrific. And I'm hoping that maybe we have uh, potentially like a um, uh, an assisted living uh, director that's on or, or individuals that even volunteer at nursing homes. So these are great ideas to bring back. You can garden while sitting. In, and, and this applies to more than just individuals in wheelchairs. So I'm thinking, you know, individuals that, um, that may may need to just rest a little bit. It's wonderful to have a little stool. And I love the stool on the left-hand side, but you don't have to buy a specially made stool. You can just bring a, a chair out there or you can bring a bucket. Buckets are surprisingly versatile. So I'm talking about those buckets that you would find at the hardware store or, or at a home improvement store. They're about, I think, about five gallons. Just you can turn them upside down and sit on them. Um, so various ways that you can sit and garden. You'll notice that we do have kind of a limited space here. So this is really good for growing greens and for growing herbs. 
If you can have a wide ledge on your garden, that's helpful because you can just sit on the ledge and then, you know, deadhead your plants and such. Um, here's another photo from the Chicago Botanic Garden. They had a really nice area for adaptive gardening or accessible gardening. And, you know, having this wide ledge means that you can sit and garden. Um, the only concern I have here is that you're going to have to sit kind of sideways and twist your body a little bit. Um, so in that situation, that still can cause some strain because you're having to twist to garden because you're kind of sitting sideways. This is my own raised garden bed. And um, this is one that my husband constructed for me out of uh, corrugated metal. And to make it a little bit stronger, you know, we do have wood framing, you know, four by fours, um, two by fours, and there's just enough space that, it, that I could perch on the edge and garden if I wanted to. Now, this is the right height for me. Um, so it's about, I think it's about three, just under three feet tall. So as the plants get a little bit bigger, you know, they're just at the right level for me. But, you know, you can consider this. I mean, you may be really tall you, or you may be really short. You can certainly customize that. Um, but, but think about, you know, how far can you reach? And this is particularly true for senior citizens. Um, we want to be careful that they're not overreaching. Um, so the, the rule of thumb is that when you're sitting, uh, or sitting or standing, the average person can reach two feet comfortably and garden. Now, obviously, there's some people that could probably reach two and a half feet, but the average person, two feet is fairly comfortable. Now, if you only have access to your raised garden bed from one side, you would make your bed two feet wide. Um, if you can access it from, from both sides, then you would make it four feet across. So that's why you typically see raised garden beds that are four by four or four by eight or four by 12 feet, is keeping in mind how far can you reach across. Now, I like this. I like this garden idea that came to us from Dr. Hans Kendall. Uh, Dr. Kendall um, used to office right next to me, so we would talk gardening from time to time. So he shared this photo with me. And I, I love this garden because it doesn't require a whole lot of work. So he bought some water troughs and drilled some holes in the bottom. So keep in mind, we do need to allow water to drain out the bottom so we can't have an impermeable surface. We need to have drainage holes. And then my friend Hans was quite a bit taller than me. So you'll notice that he placed these water troughs on landscape blocks to make it a little bit taller, which was more appropriate for his height. So once again, customizing the garden to fit your needs and, and your size. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you are doing raised garden gardens is what sort of soil mix. We generally recommend one third, you know, like regular mineral soil. So this is the soil you would find in the ground and then mixing it with one third sand and one third peat moss. So that's kind of the standard recommendation. You don't have to buy the expensive raised garden mixes that you see at the hardware store. So please notice here that we have hoops going around the garden. And if you look in the back, you'll see that there's a little bit of poly uh, plastic, polyethylene plastic that's peeking out. Um, so my friend Hans is very familiar with growing plants and as a faculty member. So he has converted these into mini greenhouses. So he's able to warm up the soil by capturing the solar energy of the sun and then plant early season crops, you know, such as greens and beets and whatnot. And then as the temperature warms, he takes off the plastic um, so the plants won't overheat. Um, you can think, you know, going vertically, doing towers. Now, there are all sorts of towers out there. There are hydroponic towers that I've seen. Um, this is one that's a little bit more like a bookcase. And then it's got these, these, shelves, these shelves, which will allow you to place, you know, a potting mix in there. Um, I hope you notice that there is a water line. So the water line, you can rig it so that each shelf there gets watered. Um, 
Now with this, you'll notice the shelves are not very deep. You'll have to choose plant material that's shallow rooted. You know, strawberries would be fantastic in this. Um, radishes, greens, spinach, you know, lettuce, those sorts of things would be wonderful in this. But once again, um, if you don't have to bend over, it's just so much better. Next up, you're going to see trellises. And with our trellises, we've got all different types I'm going to show you. Here we've got one for growing uh, tomatoes. So you have to give some thought as to which crops are vining. And that allows you to grow upward and you can train them. Here, um, here the tomatoes were trained to have, I believe, one liter. And then they would twist around the stem. Um, and you can do this outdoors, you can do this in a high tunnel, but make sure that the type of tomato that you're growing is an indeterminate tomato. So we've got two kinds of tomatoes. We have bush tomatoes, which usually top off at like three feet or so. And then we've got the vining or indeterminate tomatoes. So you would look for that on the label, whether it's the seed label or a plant label. And that's what you would use. And then you would train them to go up the trellis. And you can have you can have more than one liter. You know, you can have a couple liters. It just depends. Everybody's got a little different philosophy on training their tomatoes. If you see photos from commercial greenhouses, you would be shocked. They grow them for a long period of time, usually about a eight months or so, maybe even up to a year. And they just keep growing. They'll be like eight feet tall, uh, which is wonderful, um, you know, because you can certainly be picking those tomatoes, you know, without having to bend over. But, you know, obviously, if they're getting to be eight or 10 feet tall in a greenhouse, you might need a ladder, which brings its, its own challenges to it. But you don't have to worry about that in your own garden. It's not going to grow to be eight, 10 feet tall over the course of a summer. Showing you other examples of a trellis system. And this is the traditional square foot garden system. You'll see that we've got one foot squares that are marked off, um, which helps you in deciding how many plants to put, it, put in a square. With respect to trellises, you need to consider shadows. You wouldn't want the trellis on the south side of your raised garden bed or your, your regular in-ground garden. The trellises need to be on the north side. And the reason is, you know, think about the sun angle. You don't want, you don't want the trellis shading the rest of the garden. If you put it on the north side, you know, you'll have the sun come through um, from the south during the summer and uh, shadows won't be an issue. Aren't these cute? We've got tunnels here. And, and these are just modest raised garden beds that are only a foot tall but they are using uh, them as support for the tunnel here. You can certainly grow vining crops over it. I've seen all sorts of vining crops grown over the tunnels. And then, you know, you can pick the fruit or vegetables as they hang down. I've seen this at the Chihinkapa Zoo, I believe, with grapes. You could certainly do this with squash and cucumbers. And how nice, because your squash and cucumbers are not touching the soil. They're being held high, which keeps the fruit cleaner. And it might actually prevent some of the disease pathogens from, from taking hold. Other vining crops, your pole beans and pole beans. If you see in the background, we've got some fun little uh, tented structures. So it's taking um, these bamboo sticks and putting three or four of them together, tying them at the top. And that's a perfect structure for which you can grow pole beans and for uh, pole peas. So how wonderful not to have to bend over. You know, can you imagine how much effort it takes to pick bush beans, you know, and you do a hundred foot roll of them. If you can do pole beans, that's so much less effort. Same is true of cucumbers. Now, I don't have a whole lot to say that's different here other than I love this trellis. I remember going on a garden tour and taking pictures of this very unique trellis. The colors are just fun. Um, I have never seen another set of them. I don't know if this was homemade or not, but it's just fun. Um, with this trellis, we've got cucumbers growing up 
and take a look at the foliage. The foliage is absolutely pristine. So we find that if you trellis uh, cucumbers and squash and other cucurbits, a lot of times you'll have less powdery mildew, you know, just because we've got more air movement here. So other ways that you can garden without bending over, use a wheelchair. So if you are, if you've got limited mobility, you could have somebody bring the garden to you. And this is a fun one because we've got a wheelbarrow here. It looks like an old fashioned wheelbarrow and it's filled with all these brightly colored flowers. I would be remiss if I didn't mention container gardening. And I'm sure there've been numerous talks on Field to Fork over the last nine years on container gardening. So I'm not gonna go too in depth, but I just wanted to remind you that this is a good way to garden, that you can in fact, you know, take your, you know, take your container, put it on your picnic table or a table outdoors and fill it up with soil there. Um, and, and certainly you could keep them you can keep them elevated. Wonderful choices for containers would include a lot of our herbs. You see some strawberries in the right-hand side, flowers. Now, if you have a larger container, you could certainly grow tomatoes, peppers. Now, eggplants love being grown in containers because containers tend to retain the heat. And our eggplants are very much warm season crops and, and tend to grow better in a container than in the ground. Our final uh, garden to show you here is a hydroponic salad table. And this is from uh, a talk that uh, Dr. Tom Michaels gave for my Master Gardener conference many years ago. This is my former boss, so uh, a really a good friend to me. And he likes to dabble in things. So he's one of those that just started roasting coffee coffee beans, you know, so he could have his own coffee. Um, he got into hydroponic salad tables without having to do the expensive aeroponic system. He used rubber made containers. And then on top of that, he put styrofoam within the styrofoam. He cut out circles and then he has embedded these little nets to to contain the plant. And then the root system hangs down into the hydroponic solution. So absolutely love this idea, but he has created a table to, to make sure that the hydroponic salad table is at a level that would be, you know, waste level. So you could harvest, you could harvest a, a, a salad from there. And I think if you had, you know, three of these Rubbermaid containers, you could certainly grow enough to have salads for two people without any problems. But, you know, you could certainly customize the table if you didn't want to see the, the Rubbermaid or plastic container. All right, so we've designed our garden. So a little planning goes a long way to minimize stress. Now we're ready to garden. Um, so before we, we go outside, you know, we make sure we've got our hat. We want to make sure that we don't sunburn. You know, we've got our sunscreen on. Let's do some warm-up exercises. So it's all about loosening up those joints, lubricating them. Um, the first four slides or so are arthritis warm-ups that come via the Arthritis Foundation. And then the next set of exercises are some that I learned from my former chiropractor slash physical therapist. So I'm hoping that you'll move around a little bit here as we get into this next portion. And, and these are exercises that most individuals can do. These are arthritis hand warm-ups. You know, so keep in mind, you know, many individuals have arthritis in their hands or in their fingers. My mother's fingers are very much gnarly because she was a woman that loved to do crafts. Um, she did a ton of sewing. She did quilts, crocheting, uh, knitting, you name it. So her hands kind of show the effects of all of that. But it's very important to lubricate the fingers. And I'm, what I mean by that is just, you know, allowing your fingers to warm up. So you start off, you know, by having your hand spread out. And then you bring your thumb and your, your index finger together and then spread apart. You do this again with your thumb and your third finger. And then you just keep going. You know, do four reps and then, you know, um, 
change hands and then do another rep on this. So four reps for each finger. Um, and, and that helps just loosen them up. One I didn't include would be, you know, doing wrist circles. So getting your wrist uh, mobilized and warmed up. So hopefully you can see that. The next up is our trunk rotation. So we're warming up our midsection, our core, you know, cross your, or you don't have to cross your arms, but you're holding on to your arms and we've got the elbows um, at chest level. And then when you turn to the side, look over your shoulder, come back to the central position and then turn to your left side. So do this at least four times. So we're just warming up the midsection. And then of course, look over your shoulder. <clears throat> Shoulders can be problematic. Uh, so arthritis can, can get into those shoulders and, and make them painful. So I've got two sets of exercises here. They're separate. In the first exercise, you put your, your hands on your shoulder and then you stick your elbows out and then start doing some small circles. And then you can do larger circles and then go backwards. So do as many reps as you're comfortable with, but I would I would try and do a minimum of four. Now, if you're experiencing any pain here, I would stop. And of course, when it comes to doing exercises, it's always good to run these past your medical doctor or your chiropractor or your physical therapist. I'm none of those. Um, so make sure that you run those past past somebody that has a medical background uh, to make sure that they're appropriate for you. In the second exercise, we have more arm circles, but we are extending our arms outwards and then we're just making small circles and then we enlarge the circles and then I'm about to hit my desk so I can't do the, the giant circles, but then go back, go back. The arthritis hip walk, you're not going to be able to see my legs here, but, you know, sit up straight in your chair here and you can raise one hip, and start walking forward on your chair, raise the other hip. So now, now you're kind of on the edge of your chair. Now you can hold your chair and start doing the same thing. You're walking back. So you'll be moving a different set of muscles here and you know, warming up some different joints. You know, once again, we're working some in the core, but also we're working our thighs and our hips. Our final arthritis exercise is the ankle circle. You can do this standing up or you can do it sitting down. So you extend one leg at a time and then you make ankle circles. And I'm not talking, you're, you're not moving your leg. You're only moving your ankles and you're going round in circles, you know, four times to the right. Now reverse direction and go four times to the left. So those are some exercises for the joints. And these exercises came from a, a pamphlet called Arthritis and Gardening, a guide for home gardeners and small scale producers. This was published by Agra Ability and the Arthritis Foundation. So I feel pretty confident sharing these exercises with you. But once again, run them past your doctor. I have my own set of exercises that I do. I mentioned that I hurt my back when I was in my late 20s. You know, I really wish that I could take some things back. I mean, you don't appreciate the good health that you have when you're young. I jumped off a retaining wall that we were building and I wrenched my back, which, you know, then spiraled into having to go to the chiropractor. I was very fortunate because I loved my chiropractor in the Twin Cities. He wasn't just a chiropractor. He was also a physical therapist. So he brought both sets of skills and he did wonderful gentle adjustments, but over time, I started doing the exercises he provided. If, if people did these exercises on a daily basis, I don't think many people would have to go to the chiropractor. 
So I'm having to push it. So I'm middle-aged now. Um, I hate to think about that, but I am. And I look at my parents. I've been through quite a bit the last year with my parents, you know, watching them go downhill. And the one thing that I am certain of is it's, it's really important to have uh, a long period where you have quality of life. Um, I, I don't want to necessarily live a long time if I don't have that quality of life, if my mind isn't working, and if I don't have good mobility. Um, so the longer that I can have uh, a period where, where I have that high quality of life, the better. Um, so I do a lot of exercises. I probably do 20 to 25 exercises every morning. Now, these are some you can do every day, or maybe you may want to try and do them to warm up before you go outside and garden. I would suggest starting now. I mean, I know it's February, but it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to be doing these, to be increasing your flexibility. So once garden season comes, you're in good shape. Now, I have to admit, I feel really self-conscious showing pictures of myself exercising. I mean, I don't have a gym quality body. I mean, I'm not an aerobics instructor or anything. Um, I was trying to convince my 17-year-old um, to be photographed for this. And she's like, Mom, it's, it's, you're talking about arthritis. You're talking about pain. It, it, it's more authentic if it comes from me. So I'm sharing these photos of myself. I don't have I don't have the perfect body, but you know it, it's more realistic. How many people do uh, have the perfect body? Um, so on the left, I am you know first stretching out my lower back, which is very important. Um, so I hug my knees to my chest for three or five seconds, and I I repeat that three times. Now, if you do this and you experience pain, you know you could discontinue it, or you can try just doing one leg at a time. So hugging your knee to your chest, one leg at a time, and then alternating. And maybe over time, you can do both knees to your chest. The second exercise is probably the most important one for my lower back. Um, if I could only do one exercise in the morning, it would be that one. So I lie on my back with my knees up. And then I do an exercise called bridging where I lift my pelvis up and you'll see that I've got a straight line from my chest all the way up to my knees. And you can hold that anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds. And it's, it's really helpful. I do, I do three reps of this. And for some reason, that particular exercise resets my back. If I do this exercise uh, regularly, it's very helpful for gardening. Um, some other just stretches to show you before you go out to the garden. You've all seen the calf stretch. So you lean against the wall. You've got your front leg bent. Um, now make sure that you don't overflex your knee here. You want to make sure you're not sending your knee uh, too far forward. And then with your, uh, your leg in the back, you've got it extending behind you. So once again, you're trying to get that straight leg and you're stretching it out. This is also quite helpful for plantar fasciitis. So I, I try and do this stretch quite often. Um, stretching your hamstrings is helpful if you're going to be bending over in the garden. So, you know, there I am on my yoga mat and I'm just, you know, I've got one leg tucked in and then I'm trying to stretch over that other leg. Um, I've gotten so much more flexible since I've started, you know, doing all these stretches every morning. Um, and then I've included a side stretch. Now I do lots of other things too. I do, do a lot of, you know, different crunches and sit-ups. I, you know, leg lifts. I do all sorts of things, but I wanted to show you some easy exercises here, which wouldn't take you a lot of time and that you could do um, as a warm up before you go outside to garden. But also, you know, consider maybe doing some stretching when you come back from gardening. So that could be helpful as a cool down. For our final third, we are discussing ergonomic tools. So what does it mean to be ergonomic? It means it's designed for efficiency of use and for comfort. It's trying to minimize stress on your body. So keeping your body in a neutral position that doesn't overflex certain joints. Um, so very important. So this is a term that has become quite commonplace, whether you're at the office or you're in the garden. 
it's all about working smarter rather than harder. Um, so this this one, I guess I don't necessarily think of this one as being more ergonomic. This is one where you're harnessing the, the power of a drill. This is a um, bulb auger. Uh, and I, I use this to plant bulbs, but you could certainly use this to dig transplanting holes. So as you're transplanting small plugs into your garden, this could work. You just pre-drill the holes. How this works is this is a ta an attachment that's quite long. I'd say it's about two and a half feet long and it fastens onto a drill. So you can use a rechargeable drill and that's what powers the auger here. So this is a, a good one. Um, Here we've got um, a video that I'm going to try and play. So we'll see here if this works. And I don't know if the sound is going to play. Um, so this is a stand and plant transplanter. And you'll see that it's got a sharp edge on the end of it. Um, and they use that to poke a hole, not just in the plastic, but in the ground. And you'll see there's that there's a little trigger that he pulls and that expands the base of it. So it actually spreads and opens up a hole. And then the other individual is dro just dropping a plant down the middle of that. Um, so I thought that was just a really, really cool gadget. I'm gonna buy a similar one for the Master Gardener program. We have a trunk of ergonomic tools, but I thought that was absolutely fabulous. And that comes to us from Shared Legacy Farms. So transplanting without having to bend over, fantastic. Ergonomics also means using long handled tools. So we are in fact using uh, elements of physics, um, so laws of physics, so we're thinking about using the shovel as a lever. So when you have those long handles, we're transferring energy to the shovel and it can do more work. A couple of shovels that I've, I've worked with. Um, I wanted to test the root slayer. The root slayer is on the left and I probably should have blown up the photo more. On one side, we've got just a, a sharp straight edge and then on the other side, it looks a little bit like a saw. So you could use it to cut roots. You know, that could be helpful if you're trying to dig something up. So I wanted to see how the root slayer did versus a well sharpened shovel. So this was just an ordinary shovel that had been sharpened using a grinder. And boy, oh boy, that, sh that well-sharpened shovel did a whole lot better than the root slayer when I was trying to dig up daylilies in the NDSU campus garden. So we frequently dig up the daylilies to divide them when the clumps get too big or if we've had frost heaving. Um, but I'll tell you, you don't need to necessarily buy the most expensive tool. Instead, Take care of the shovels you have. A lot of people don't realize that you can sharpen your shovel and then it just slips into the ground so much easier with a lot less force. Uh, that's just very helpful information to have. And, and there, there's lots of information. You can certainly Google online and see how to sharpen a shovel. I'm sure there's YouTube videos. I'm sure there are articles out there. There are different ways of doing it. But it's really nice to know that, you know, this can be done and you can keep that blade sharp. So going back to ergonomics. So I think about ergonomics a lot because I injured my hand during the pandemic. So I, I play piano, I play flute. I, and I, I used to do a lot of that when I was a teenager and all the way through college. But, you know, during during my working years, I really didn't play piano as much. And then all of a sudden, my daughter had to have uh, a virtual recital from our home during the pandemic. So I had to accompany her. We had no other accompanist that could do that. So I had to learn this really complex Italian piece. And I dove into it, practiced for a month and did it. But lo and behold, my hands don't work the same way that they did when I was 18. I really hurt I really had a, a major hand injury and had to be more conscious of using all sorts of ergonomic things. So I now use an ergonomic keypad, which is split in the middle. And then instead of having to hold my hands straight, um, I'm able to hold them at an angle, which is more natural. 
and then take a look at that mouse. I don't know if you can see it. Um, oh goodness, I'm trying to hold this up to the camera. I've got a really tall mouse and then I hold it sideways. So it's a little bit more of like a pistol grip. And that just makes more sense for my hands. And I, uh, my hands have now healed fortunately since then, but I'm just more aware that I need to have an ergonomic grip on my tools. We, you can certainly put handles on your tools. You can have a D handle and there are more ergonomic ones that are out there. So this has got a nice handle that you can grip, but on the right hand side, you'll see that it's tilted at an angle. Um, so the angle allows it so that you can actually grip it a little bit better and keep your wrist at a more neutral position rather than having it cranked like that. Uh, Stand up when you weed. I, I know there are a lot of individuals out there that hand weed because you're like, oh, I got to get that whole root. And yes, that is a more efficient way of weeding, you know, for, to get the whole root. But frankly, you know, if you're having pain, it might be time to give that up and use a hoe and stand up straight. The, the stirrup hoe is, is one of my favorite hoes. I, I learned it as hula hoe growing up. I don't know why. I suppose it reminded people of hula dancers and that circular. I don't know. I didn't name the thing. I call it a stirrup hoe. And you'll notice that it has a trapezoid type shape and then it's hollow in the center and then the blade on the bottom is fairly sharp. What's nice about the stirrup hoe is that you can, you can, um, hoe going both forward and back. So you've on the push stroke and then on the pull stroke, you get an action and, and, and can work more efficiently. Um, so really love that. I also love my little hand hoe that's on the, the right hand side. So if you do like to kneel down and, and weed, this works very nicely and you can get a little bit more reach because of the handle on that particular hoe. Pruners. Uh, pruners can be difficult if you have hand pain. Fortunately, there are lots of new models on the market. There are ratcheting pruners, with, which supposedly use less hand force. Um, Felco has come out with a, a number of new pruner models. You'll see I've got the Felco 5 on the left. That's my old pruners. I'm thinking about upgrading to one of the newer models that we have. Now, they're, they're quite expensive. Uh, and I'm not recommending one pruner over another, but I just happen to notice that they've got all sorts of new pruners and they're cognizant that we've got people of different, you know, hand sizes. So you actually take a little quiz. So you can have either small, medium or large hand. Are you right handed or are you left handed? We have ignored our left handed friends for too long. It's really wonderful that they are now building tools to uh, accommodate those individuals that are left-handed. Um, you know, how much weight can you hold in your hand? Do you want a, a pruners that are kind of substantial or one that's a little lighter weight? Um, what sort of branches are you gonna be pruning? Are they gonna be th really thin branches? Are they gonna be a little bit thicker? So that's obviously going to play into it. Um, brand new is they've got this revolving handle, which is supposed to reduce the necessary force. I have not seen the newer model of this that's got the revolving handle, but it's supposed to be better. The one piece of advice that I have in picking out a pruner, you don't have to buy Felco. There's, there's others that are out there. Just make sure that you're buying a bypass pruner. And with the bypass pruners, it's more like a scissors. So the the blades slide past one another. You don't want to have an anvil pruner. An anvil pruner is one that has a flat part on the bottom, and then you've got the cutting blade on the top. And 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 with that, the, the cutting blade lands on the anvil. And unfortunately, that tends to crush the stem rather than cut it. ergonomic handles. Look at these tools. They're beautiful. And we've got that curved handle on them. So I'll show you a close up of that. As you'll see that we've got that curved handle. And the nice thing with this curved handle is that it keeps your wrist. I don't know if you can see that very well. It keeps your wrist at a neutral angle, particularly when you're digging in the ground. Now, if you're trying to dig in the ground with a regular straight handled 
pruner, you're going to be cranking your wrist a little bit, which puts strain on it. So that's the theory um, of why they came up with these curved handle um, tools. We've got pistol grip tools. And with our pistol grips, you'll see that, uh, that th these are for individuals that don't have a whole lot of hand strength, a whole lot of grip strength. Um, and this just puts less pressure on it. And it's just, just nicely, nicely designed. Now, if you don't have a whole lot of wrist strength, you can buy this little uh, appendage here, which is a cuff that goes around your arm. And then you can harness the power of your arm as you are digging. So not just using, uh, using the power of your lower muscles, but also your arm muscles. So that helps stiffen it and give you a little bit more support. If you're in a wheelchair, you can certainly have long handled tools. Um, so I can imagine, you know, you sitting in the garden in a wheelchair, you've got these long handles and it's, it's amazing what you can do with this. Uh, but as you plan your garden, if you've got a wheelchair, um, so plan for wide aisles, which will allow you to get in there with that wheelchair. Uh, so we're starting to come towards the end here. This is probably one of my favorite tools. I can imagine there are some of you out there. Um, you don't have a problem kneeling. It's getting back up. Um, so this is fabulous. We've got a pad on the bottom, and then we've got those raised arms. And with that, you can push yourself back up. And it's multi-use. So it's important to take breaks as we garden. Um, you know, that can help us with injury. So turn it over and you've got this nice little bench for sitting there, taking a break and admiring your handiwork. Um, what's wonderful about this device is that it does fold so that it stores nicely. Um, other things for gardening while sitting, we've got this device here and this is wonderful. So, so say you've got a hundred foot row in-ground garden and you're picking things, um, you can just sit on this. You'll notice it's got a swivel seat and you can just push yourself uh, down the roll or pull yourself down the roll and continue sitting and, and picking things or harvesting or, or whatever it is that you're doing. Finally, you need a cart. So instead of, you know, lugging things around that are heavy, put it in this cart. Now I've got a cart at home too, and it's wonderful because it just folds up and I can just put it right in my car. Um, but it's got nice big wheels so you can roll that over your lawn or into your garden. So it's all about working smart, working uh, smarter rather than harder. So I'm hoping that you enjoyed this. I'm hoping that you will take something away from this and uh, maybe there'll be some questions here. So hopefully we've got a little bit of time here. Um, so besides questions, if you've got any suggestions for gardening smarter rather than harder, we'd love to see those too. Well, thank you. This was great. <clears throat> thank you. And by the way, I have the same mouse on my computer. It's the best thing I ever got. <laughs> um, some questions for you. Where do you get some of these tools? Yes, yes. Where do we get some of these tools? I have noticed them in some of the independent garden centers. I've noticed them in Bismarck. I haven't seen them as much here in Fargo, but I, I have, I ordered them online. So Radius Garden was the one that had the ergonomic handle to it. So this would be Radius Garden. So I believe they're online. There's the there's another website called The Right Stuff, W-R-I-G-H-T. I mean, Amazon carries some of these. Now, I, I'd love to send you to your garden center because I love to I would love to keep the money locally because because of the multiplier effect. But if you can't find it there, um, there's certainly all sorts of stuff on the Internet. Very good. And you got some props, some kudos for being a good exercise role model. <laughs> and especially the bridge exercise. So there you go. Um, one thing I wanted to let everyone know is that we did post a stretching toward better health guide with the field to fork information. So you can check that out, print it out. And you have a couple of subject questions. Um, one is about peat moss. 
peat moss is getting harder to get. Do you have an alternative you would recommend? All right. So peat moss, peat moss is harder to get, particularly for this year. I'm, I'm trying to remember what weather conditions they had up in Canada. I can't remember if it was, they might've had a, a rainy season where the peat bogs are. So it's definitely more expensive and a little harder to get this year. As far as alternatives, if you're adding this to your raised garden bed, you can substitute compost. You would want to make sure there's no herbicide residue in the compost. So that's certainly a nice substitute. Or you can use Coir, C-O-I-R, and that is a waste product from coconut production. You're going to start seeing more substitutes um, for peat moss going into the future, there's been you know, some controversy as to how sustainable it is to continue using peat moss, um, particularly since it is harvested from peat bogs. We have another pest question. I have a lot of slugs and snails that attack my garden. How can I eliminate them without harming my garden? There are many different many different things you can try. You can try diatomaceous earth. So you sprinkle diatomaceous earth around your, the plants that you're trying to protect. The slugs are soft bodied, so they don't like to crawl over it. Um, that's one possibility. I'm starting to see copper products on the market. So you actually have copper strips you can put around your plants and supposedly the slug gets an electrical charge as they go over it. There are chemicals you can use. I don't recommend metaldehyde because metaldehyde is really toxic. Um, there is another product made out of iron phosphate. Um, brand names would be Sluggo or Escargo, which works. I would still keep your pets away from that iron phosphate product, um, but it is supposed to be a little, it's supposed to be less toxic than the metaldehyde. Very good. Uh, this question just popped in and we've gotten something similar. I'm looking at ways to make large containers lighter. Any ideas? Oh, yes, yes. N now you could certainly put like um, packing peanuts on the bottom. Um, you could put, I sometimes just do like Plastic, old plastic bottles, like liter bottles. So I'm talking, you know, really big pots and you're trying to make them light, but you still need to have enough soil that the plant um, is going to be healthy. So you can't, if you've got a really deep container, yes, you can put stuff on the bottom, but keep in mind that you're raising up the soil, uh, the soil line. You still want to make sure that the depth of the soil is sufficient for the root system. Um, and a couple other questions. We're almost out of time. Um, most of the handled tools I've found are too short, and I'm definitely not tall, and you end up having to bend them to use them. Have you ever run into that issue? Okay. So these are the long handled having to bend them to use them? Um, I guess I haven't. I mean, I... I one thing you could do, so you're saying the handle is too long. There is a new product on the market where it's it's essentially another one of those D-shaped handles. And it straps onto the shovel. Um, and you put it like kind of midway through. So instead of having to bend so much to shovel, to bend, to use the tool, you know, you're holding onto the top of the tool and then you've got this other handle that's sticking out of the middle of the shovel and it's allowing you to use it a little bit better so it's like an ergonomic second handle and I'm seeing these on snow shovels I haven't tried it yet but I was looking at that maybe that could help a little bit you don't have to bend as much I mean you're just kind of holding it more towards the top and you could install that second handle which allows you to control it I'm uh, sorry, it's it's hard to envision this without a picture. Oh, actually, the person who asked the question came back in the chat. Handles are too short, and you have to bend yourself to use them. I was missing who you have to bend. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> All right, they're too short. You can replace the handles. There we go. I, it, I, you can go to any hardware store and they've got different lengths of handles on them. So that's certainly easy to do. That's a little bit easier than trying to shorten them. Um, it's easier to buy a longer handle. And, and just, just keep in mind that you can substitute that longer handle. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Uh, one last question. Uh, after moving, I have several Rubbermaid types of containers. If I drill holes in the bottom, are they safe? for raised beds? I, now, yes, yes. They are safe for raised beds. There shouldn't be an issue. I, I know there are some individuals that are starting to worry about nanoparticles from plastic and such, but we don't really have enough research saying that it's not safe. I, I don't have an issue using those Rubbermaid or similar brands of containers. Um, there really shouldn't be a toxicity issue to them at this stage. Now, there's going to be more, more research into nanoparticles and all of that, but right now, I think it's okay, particularly if they are fairly clean. Now, if you've been storing used oil in there or chemicals, then no, then, then the deal is off. As long as they were used in a manner which was fairly clean and you're not storing chemicals or toxins in them, I think they should be just fine. All right. Well, with that, it's 3.02. And I just want to thank all of you for joining us and especially Esther for assembling a really great talk. We really appreciate your time and expertise and inspiring us to do more exercise too. <laughs> so thank you everyone. I hope to see you next week. We're going to learn more about food storage. So we're going to continue our way through field to fork. Thanks again, everyone. Mm -hmm.